Shalom, shalom, shalom to everyone watching. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero. As we are continuing the review of chapter 7 of the book To Be a Jew. This is a continuation of our series To Be a Jew in English. And so we left off that there are some underlying principles that are the basis of Jewish law in areas of family life. Of course, we understand very completely that what is the key to happiness has to do with the family. Now, there are different cultures, as we we've mentioned in the other video, first video, that you have uh, the culture of Christianity and Muslim, which may be similar, but very different in the approach to the family. Well, Jewish ideal is intended to elevate the human being and society to bring happy and meaningful life to the greatest numbers, it by no means intends to solely make people happy. Making people happy by satisfying some immediate desire or physical urge at the expense of higher values was never the aim of Judaism. On the contrary, the indiscriminate gratification was regarded as a gross and vulgar a concession to human weakness. This is nonetheless what expresses in today's society and culture as hedonism, which is in its most vulgar forms reduces the human being into merely an object possessed of no higher imperatives than that of the satisfaction of the physical drives and urges. Where men and women were, have abandoned the commandments and the Torah, we find that happiness drops also in correlations. The immediate joy and pleasure derived from having invariably yielded, yielded to misery and bitterness. There is no doubt that the observance of the Jewish family laws have contributed mightily to the stability of Jewish family and society in general. While these laws are not an automatic panacea of personal happiness caused by their external factors, the personality of maladjustments, they do provide the formula for a stable, tranquil, in harmonious and satisfying family relationship between parents and children, between husband and wife, and they do provide for a formula for good, clean, living and wholesome attitudes. They do provide the formula of elevating the sexual relationships from a form in which we do not appreciably differ from the animal kingdom to sacred expressions of love and higher spiritual plane, worthy of being a kingdom of priests in the holy nation. So let's uh, take an examination of some of the traditional Jewish values and teachings about husband-wife relationship, as it's probably less understood and appreciated by contemporary persons in the laws relating to the, pa the parent-child relationship. The growing numbers of families breaking up, even among the Jews today, testifies to the unfortunate fact that these laws are less widely observed and understood, and therefore, as a Jew, born Jewish, who may define him or herself as Jewish, begins to break down even the relationship between husband and wife when they move away from those laws and teachings that Judaism basically establishes as the fundamentals of a Jewish family. It's a general attitude towards marriage that the Jewish tradition reorganizes the fact of that procreation and the begetting of children is one of the major purposes of marriage. To sear children is to fulfill, fulfill the mitzvah of the biblical commandment to be fertile and increase. Reproduction because an, a main issue of Judaism. It gives meaning to divine blessing, fulfills the divine purpose, it makes partners with the Almighty in ongoing process of creation. The minimum number of children one must have to fulfill the mitzvah is, according to some, two children, a boy and a girl. However, what gives religious sanction or spiritual legitimacy to the marriage relationship if it's not from the Creator? Marriage has its own legitimacy, significance and meaning apart from children. It has its own sanctity before God commanded, be fertile and increase. Be set about creating a wife for Adam because it's not good that a man should be alone and it would make him a help me. 
Companionship and love in goodwill uh, necessary for the relationship is presented at the very first and primary purpose of marriage. While the importance of having children is stressed, the marriage itself, the coming together of, as a man and a wife, has also been a prime target of rabbinic concern. God waits impatiently for a man to marry. This we understand this by what it says in the Talmud in Kiddushin 29b. One who does not marry, listen very closely, men, one who does not marry dwells without blessing, without goodness, without peace. Yabamot 62b. So if you're thinking of complaining about your, the wife that you have, keep in mind that this is a good that God has given over to you. And we should look at it as such. Kiddushim 29b in Pesachim 113a says, He who has no wife cannot be considered a whole person. He's missing something. It is in having a wife that in the opinion of our sages completes a man as a man. So if you feel that you're missing something, it's because you're missing that other half, which is what God created in every single human being to be able to have. Now the biblical lessons of Eve, having been created, help me to Adam, was not lost upon them, nor both of them without God, as it says in Genesis Rabbah, chapter 8, verse 9. Sums up the Jewish concept of marriage in a very simple way. This is the Jewish ideal which applies to all without distinction, rabbis and laymen, priests and prophets, even a person who perhaps have no knowledge regarding Torah or rabbinical Judaism. The biblical emphasis on companionship in marriage in no way implied a preference for a platonic relationship between a man and a woman, nor did it call for the natural repression of a God-given physical and emotional need. It stood to reason then that the sexual relationship between a man and a wife should be treated positively and accepted in the favorable light. The Jew is indeed forbidden from denying his wife the physical, physical and biological satisfaction of her sexual wants, apart from any consider, consideration of procreating. Biblical law considers intercourse as a basic duty and one of the responsibilities of a married man just as he must provide with his wife or to his wife clothing and shelter uh, and a basic right, so he must not deny her sexual satisfaction. Her food, her clothing, her conjugal rights shall not be withheld. Exodus chapter 21 verse 10. These rights were recognized when there were no possibilities of conception. And thus, a woman can no longer bear children for medical reasons or was regarded pregnant, had passed her menopause, it is quite apparent that in Jewish traditional tradition, the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is not merely condoned or given legitimacy so as to procreate the race, but possess its own merit. Within the sanctified relationship of a marriage bond, sex is never treated as something nasty and dirty, obscene or shameful. The contrary is the case. Sex is positive it's necessary, and it is a good for both the husband and the wife. Jewish tradition condemns, in the strongest possible terms, all forms of lewdness, of harlotry, promiscuity, and adultery. Coquetteness is part of that triangle, as it were, and strictly prohibits that these, as well as other forms of incestuous sexual transunion, including homosexuality and sodomy, as Eva, abominable, leading to the decay of the people and the contamination of the, la of the land and of society. However, it speaks with glowing enthusiasm about the beauty of sexual relationship when expressing the intimate love between a man and a woman when the sanctified union of marriage, the beauty and character, even within health of the offspring, were thought of by our sages to be influenced by the quality of sexual relationship. Whether or not this view will, ev will ever be scientifically validated or not is not important. This conviction on their part is at least a strong reflection of their healthy attitude towards sex in the marriage. Jewish law clearly indicates its appreciation of importance of the proper attitude prior to coitus uh, or intimacy, intimacy and sets forth 
ruling guides or guiding rules. It warns against approaching a wife when forcing her to submit against her will. It warns her against engaging in intercourse while under the influence of alcohol or while the couple is quarreling or and hatred divides them. Maimonides, Rambam, sums up the Jewish law in this respect rather succinctly. Sexual union should be consummated only, only out of desire and as a result of joy of the husband and the wife. Just as eating and drinking through the laws of Kashrut were elevated within Jewish faith to a level where the, it constituted one of the most important ways by which the Jew acknowledged his maker and served him, it is also regarded to the satisfaction of the sexual drive. Eating is necessary and good, but Kashrut impresses upon us that not all food is clean nor necessarily beneficial, nor do we have in the same aspect with, uh, for health and spiritual reasons. As applied to sexual relationship, Jewish law insists that sex too, although necessary and desirable, may not always be good and clean, and that it is not too necessarily desirable at all times. And it means that the Jewish acknowledged limitations and disciplines relative to the satisfactions of these drives. It also means that it's pure and impure, sacred and defiled. The limitation placed upon the sexual expression by Jewish law and tradition in situations outside the marriage relationship have already been alluded to. Even within marriage, we have noted that some conditions under which sages advise against intercourse but there's another area of sexual discipline that remains to be elaborated, for it serves as the crown to what is known as Jewish family purity. Tahara Mishpah, Tahara which means family purity. The importance of coming back together after a period of time to be able to strengthen the marriage. Then refer to the laws which forbid sexual relationship, even between husband and wife, beginning with the onset of the monthly menstrual period. On the average, a woman, this means about 12 days. Some would say about even 8 or 9 days, depending how they begin to count their clean days. Now, during this period of time, she is forbidden to her husband to have intimacy. And here, too, is a reason they are not given the Torah. What purpose does it serve? Several possibilities have been suggested. Number one, to extend one's self-discipline to those drives and desires which her passion often overcomes in reason to destroy the elementary good, good judgment, and also brings home harm to others as well as to oneself. Strength, the sages teach us, consists of the capacity to rule our passions and not only allow our passions to master us. Per Keavot, or Ethics of the Father, chapter 4, verse 1. Holiness in the Jewish conceptual framework demands such strength, self-discipline. Consideration for emotional feelings or the physical condition of the wife for whom intercourse during the period of time might be objectionable. To minimize this element of boredom and routine, it has developed to keep the flame between husband and wife alive both psychologically as well as biologically. So therefore, separation between husband and wife during this period of time does not exhaust the spiritual directive that this encompasses in the areas of family purity. So the issue of looking at the calendar or glancing to watch does not remove the woman from her state of nida. Her, her, uh, her nida is a state when the woman is in her period. A spiritual significant ritual does that it basically brings the ability for the woman to renew her spiritual connection and her spirituality from being in the state of impurity to purity. This separation of, of time, though it may be brief, is renewed every month as she goes into the water of mikvah, without which there is a separation and renews her connection with her, her husband after submerging into the, the mikvah water. One that ritually qualifies for that purpose has always been a Jewish rite of purification, mikvah, or tevilah. During the time of the temple, the priest had to undergo immersion before 
being permitted to enter the sacred duties. Converts to Judaism also, both men and women must undergo uh, immersion in a mikvah. And symbolizing a spiritual pure purification as a final rite of their conversion, without which no conversion is valid, is precisely this rite which a Jewish wife must fulfill each month until after her menopause. Now, interesting enough, uh, before we had such a, an incredible increase in mikvah, the Jewish women many times had to go to the beach to submerge. And it's very important to understand that a lot of people, the idea of modesty is of a great importance, especially for the women. So those women that perhaps find themselves that don't, are not near a mikvah, they ought to go in a combination of two or three to the beach where the woman could be able to submerge and come out towards the late time of the of the night. Not that it was all dark, but just between, just as it's getting dark, you go to the beach and then submerge, according to the Ramba, and uh, Hilichot um, uh, 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 is, 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 is tractate of Hilichot a mikvah, he makes mention that even if a woman submerges with all her clothes on, it does not negate. Because some people would think interposition, you know, she went into the water with clothes on and therefore it's invalid. Not, not at all. Neither for conversion is it invalid and neither for mikvah to come out of her nida. So this is what we recommend normally if there's not a mikvah accessible to you or has been prohibited by Jewish communities, Orthodox communities. Remember, you always have a free place to do mikvah at the beach or river. Very important, though, to observe modesty in those places that perhaps you will not be able to remove your clothes. There's no mitzvah in removing your clothes and therefore violate the laws of modesty. This is why we are very careful and teaching a lot of the people that we are involved in to make sure that it is, it is okay to be able to go to the beach, have clothes on, and, and be able to submit in a beach or river with clothes on, and you don't have to take off your clothes. I had to make a correction to this to a group that was in Colombia regarding the same thing, because they had taught him, this particular leader, that no, no, you have to take, that the women have to take all their clothes. And this is the problem because it's about peekaboo. It's a big issue also in the Orthodox community. They want to be able to have a free peek. No, my friends, that's immodesty and it's a big chelo Hashem when you have the leaders teaching people, in particular the women, okay, it's okay to take off your clothes and don't worry, we'll put like a little curtain around the beach. Just one mistake can be able to, to basically break completely the whole sense of of purity and, and modesty as they dump themselves into the water. So I'm one that's completely against that practice, and I consider the practice very, basically invalidating the very conversion because you have their intentions that are not well suited for that purpose. This is why it's better to have a mikvah, obviously, where the woman could be able to submerge in a kosher mikvah. And thank God here in Florida, they just opened up a public mikvah for conversions as well as for uh, this purpose, where many Orthodox communities have closed the doors in the face of such situations. Now, many have written about the mikvah, he'll quote, mikvah the Rambam, is very, very focused on that and very clearly stated that it does not invalidate a conversion or a purity process. Precisely this rite, which a Jewish wife must fulfill each month until after her menopause. Now, many writers on the subject of mikvah have marshaled impressive evidence that there are no hygienic or medical advantage that accrues for the proper observance of this rite. The primary purpose, nevertheless, is spiritual in nature, enabling a wife to be able to be to bring herself again completely without reservation to her husband, and for her husband to receive her in like spirit. The immersion of a mikvah is not intended to be in lieu of, of cleaning, cleansing the, the bath or required by ordinary standards of hygiene. It emphasizes the requirement that a bath must precede the immersion in the mikvah. In fact, 
all the dirt or foreign matter must be scrupulously cleansed off before immersion. Authentic Jewish family life cannot take place without the presence of a mikvah in the community unless there's no such thing. And like I just mentioned, the Rambam, we recommend if there is no mikvah, you have no access, they close the doors on you, utilize the beach or natural flowing waters, which is kosher as a kosher mikvah. Observant Jewish women are known to travel great distance to, to a mikvah when they live far. However, in many countries, like I just mentioned, will prohibit the use of mikvah, and thus, halakhically speaking, a beach or natural spring of water, which is living water, would suffice to be able to fulfill this monthly requirement, if need be, if you have no access to, to a kosher mikvah. Now, Jewish life can proceed without a synagogue, or a makeshift arrangement or prayer and suffice, even a home can be transformed in part of the home as a kahila, as a congregation, but it cannot proceed without a mikvah. This is why it's so important that one of my uh, Talmudims that became a rabbi, that we helped him become a rabbi in Chile, one of the first things he did, which was proper, he was able to find a place where he can bring people together to meet, but he also, first thing he did was create a mikvah. And this allows for the women in the community of his community to be able to have them be able to do that as well for the use of the purpose for conversion. Which obviously in Chile, uh, they put a lot of blocks just like they were going to do in Indonesia. And let me mention this, because a lot of the, the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox rabbis, especially Hasidic ones, try to stop um, and, and tangle up and prohibit the use of mikvah for only the issues of, of tahara mishpacha, and therefore prohibit the use for for conversions, because they're not into they want no dealing with issues of conversion, and yet it's proper and okay to utilize uh, a mikvah that both you know the women Anita as well for conversion can go to. Now this is why. Religious kibbutzim in Israel arranged for a mikvah almost immediately without delay build, building of the synagogue until they can afford it. The modern, clean, antiseptic looking mikvah today is used in temperature of controlled water in nice and warm and, and perfectly done, maybe a far cry from the, the mikvahs of old. And today, the mikvah built and used on top of Masada overlooking Dead Sea even from those in use in generations ago, but the principle is still the same. The purpose are the same. The spiritual link between generations remain intact. The laws of family purity are even more neglected by contemporary Jews than the Shabbat and Kashrut because of the total ignorance of this very existence. And these laws rather deliberate rejection. It's obviously not the kind of subject or matter that uh, you'll find in an elementary Hebrew school. And therefore, it's not brought through children to the attention of parents. It can be taught that Jewish children on senior high school level, but there are no few Jewish children who continues to that level, except for oblique reference to the general subject of family law, the Charaf Mishbacha, which unlearned listeners may interpret in a number of different ways. It does not lend itself to detailed teachings from the pulpit, since the observance of family purity is confined in intimate relationship of a husband and a wife. Friends and neighbors will not be aware of its observance, as they might be in, in the areas of Kashrut or Shabbat. Even children in a family observing family purity laws might not be aware that such an observance until they go grow old, older or become aware of the mikvah as actually told about them. The, the so-called uh, exceptions should be found in every community that Jews are gathered in the practice of Torah observance is enacted. And thus, it should not be ignorance of its provision. It's quite probably distorted ideas. Now, what is this with all the spiritual purity of Jewish family and traditional values that have brought a light happiness and tranquility into the Jewish home. 
It is these values that are from ancient, from the time of the Torah. And the values inherent of these laws cannot be disassociated from those values in such rabbinical and rabbinic guidelines. One who loves his wife as himself honors her more than himself concerning him does the scripture say, and you shall know that there is peace within your tent. You have Amot 62b and Sanhedrin 76b. A man should always be scrupulous in the honor he accords his wife, for blessing is found in a man's home only by virtue of one's wife. So th those who think that, no, I can treat my wife the way I want, completely wrong. I had a case that's right now we're dealing with from a man who basically uh, we help do the matchmaking and happens to be a, a, a wife beater. Yes, a wife beater. He was without a woman for many, many, many years, and she became enthralled with passionate love for him, and so married them, and he became a wife beater. As a matter of fact, we we're supposed to be working on trying to get his, get her to get so she could be freed, and you know to to, to move on on his life. And this is sad because it, it, it's despicable when you see a Jewish man beating their wives. Ah. Oh, oh, horrible, or prohibiting her from going to a mikvah. It is the wife's obligation to let his man know, or her husband know, that she is in a state of impurity. That's her obligation to let him know so that he would not be fondling or meddling around any further. And thus we read in Baba Metziah, man should always be scrupulous in the honor he accords his wife for the blessing is found in a man's home only by virtue of one's wife. So if you want blessings in your life, you've got to honor your wife. Your wife is the one that brings all of the parnosa, all of the blessings into the home. It is on merit of her that abundance of blessings come into a man's home. Not because of the man, but because of the woman he has that basically nourish these spiritual values. In our next video, we're going to take a look about honoring parents. This becomes very important, especially in today's society, when we're dealing with so many children from divorced homes, that there's a, a certain sense that they feel that they can be able to disrespect the father or the mother in the broken home situation. And many of those other parents become actually very abusive as it's known even in the legal cases where you have um, parents who basically put, bring to war and hatred in the children's mind and heart and psyche against the other parent. And this, my friend, is very troubles, troubling because this is not the Jewish culture or custom or way of life. It is the culture of the world in which they have succumbed to such idea. And it, did, and it goes right against the commandment of honor your father and your mother so that your days would be prolonged. But we'll look at that topic in our next video. Shalom, shalom.